Okay, my friends, this is about as serious as it gets. If you've been with me at all, you know I have been going deep, deep, deep into all of the ancient religious texts from all over the world. And they all have a similarity and they all have a little bit of a different take on things, but it's all understandable as one big thing that happened from different perspectives. Just like if I see something and you see something at the same time, there's going to be little things that you're going to see that are, I may not have seen or that you take in a different way than I take. And that is what history is. So what do you do? You just read one book? No. You read them all. And then you make a determination. And the first books literally that were written were the first accounts were the Egyptians and, and so forth, and Hesiod, Hesiod, who was, he wrote what the daughters of Zeus told him to write about the ancient past, which was Zeus's take on history and the myth and the gods. But then you have to go to all of the other writers but he really pre-set the foundation. Hesiod, they call him Hesiod, I call him Hesiod. But he wrote, literally, if it's true, the daughters of Zeus were called the Muses. And they were, they were godly little creatures. Zeus was their father. He was the god of this entire solar system. I know some people are going to find this very offensive. But it might be yes, it might be no, I don't know. But Jesus Christ said, search until you find. That means don't stop searching just because it's scary or, or it goes against what you're thinking. Keep searching. And he said, when you find, you'll be disturbed and you will marvel. And so far, all of the things that he wrote about us being about light and all of that stuff, I can't find anything that he wrote that isn't supported by some physical evidence. You know, he did miracles, he did all these things, he's very, very well celebrated in history, Jesus Christ. So I'm going with him. My, let me just get to the, the bottom line. Here's the way I'm seeing things now. It was a terrible, disastrous nightmare on earth here. And I'm going to be reading you through Genesis, which now I have a whole new take on that. I never really read it much before, it's just nonsense until you find the physical evidence that supports it. And that these things were possible. These gods had, had powers that you just can't even imagine. If you write, read Ovid, O-V-I-D, his, his work was Metamorphosis. And he talks about transformation. Metamorphosis means to change from one thing into something else. And the gods themselves, like Jupiter, was Zeus. The planet Jupiter was Zeus, according to the ancient myth. And Zeus could change himself into a hot-looking guy, come down to Mount Olympus, and hey, he set up a sex palace on Mount Olympus. This is what was written in the ancient text, and then it goes on from there how he had sex with all the different women. He was, he could change himself into anything he wanted. He could change himself into being somebody else's husband. It was, uh, this just, it's a, it's a mind-shattering thing. And this is going to be quite long, and I am going to read to you the first words written in Genesis and so forth, and I'm going to equate them to all the other things that I have found that support or, or uh, well, pretty much everything is supported. It's all basically the same, taken from different perspectives. So let's just get started. Okay, I'm trying to put things together here. I'm going back through these ancient texts. Now, this is um, Exodus, I believe, 13. And the Lord said to Moses, Dedicate to me the firstborn son of every family and the firstborn male of your flock and herds. These belong to me. Now, dedicate to him. I don't know. Let's keep looking. Moses said to the people, Remember this day in the month of Abib. It is the day when the Lord's mighty power 
rescued you from Egypt. This is during the Exodus. This is what this is all about, the Exodus, as they got away from being enslaved in Egypt, where according to this, this talk, uh, uh, book, the, they inflicted all kinds of plagues and just unbelievable things on the Egyptians and the Pharaoh said, no, I'm going to still keep you enslaved. And finally he said, get the hell out. Don't ever come back and here, take a bunch of gold and silver and everything and just leave. And that's what's happening at this point. Now, remember, it's the day when the Lord's mighty power rescued you from Egypt where you were slaves. Do not, now here's where it gets really crazy. This I, I want to try to understand. Do not eat anything made with yeast. This goes for seven days. Okay, this is uh, interesting and a little disturbing because he's saying, do not eat anything with yeast. First of all, why? That's a big question in my mind because it's big in this. Where do you sit here? Now, he says, the Lord promised your ancestors that he would bring you into the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Hivites, and Jebusites. He, the, you're going to come, the, the uh, Isra Isra Israelites are going to come in and take over this land, apparently. Uh, that's a little disturbing. It's going to give the, these people's lands to them. But anyway, it is a land rich with milk and honey. Each year during the month of Abib, celebrate these events in the following way. Now listen to this again about the yeast. All right, here's... The only way I can understand why you shouldn't have yeast is, first of all, it's, it's a biological agent. It's a, it's a fungus, basically. Now, when they left Egypt, they wrapped up dough in cloth or something, and it hadn't risen yet, and it never did rise, and they cooked it as unleavened bread. And that's basically what this is all about, is unleavened bread. And it's, but it's so serious about this yeast, it, it, it makes me start to think something's not right here. It's just for, here's the way you're going to um, set up this festival. Do it in the following way. For seven days, you are to eat bread made without yeast. No yeast, but it's bread. On the seventh day, you are to celebrate a festival in honor of the Lord. During those seven days, you must not eat anything made with yeast, nothing made with yeast, or even have yeast anywhere near your homes. What is this, this obsession with yeast? It's, it, it's very unbelievable about the yeast. Okay, so they're just eating this flatbread for seven days. And then on the seventh days, you have to tell your children, the reason you haven't been getting normal bread is because of what the Lord did for us. So this is really like a training exercise. It, you know, it's a whole week. That's a lot. And, and it's they're just eating like crackers instead of a nice fluffy bread. Maybe that's why they did it. But anyway, it says, This celebration will be like wearing a sign on your hand or on your forehead, because then you will pass on to others the teaching of the Lord, whose mighty power brought you out of Egypt. Celebrate this festival each year at the same time. So it's like Christmas or something, that type of thing. Okay, well, here's what it says. The, you perform that festival at the same time every year. The Lord will give you the land of the Canaanites, as he promised. From then on, you must give him every firstborn son from your family. So you've got to give them to God. And every firstborn male from your animals, because these belong to God, to him. All right, this is kind of confusing, but it says, you can say, he says all the firstborn males belong to God. He says you can save the life, in other words, he's taking their lives, it seems to me, of a firstborn donkey by sacrificing a lamb. So he's taking the lives of all these firstborns. If you don't, you must break the donkey's neck. 
All right, so you can save the life of a firstborn donkey by sacrificing a lamb. If you don't, you must break the donkey's neck. You must save every firstborn son. Now, you're saving them, but you're, he's taken the life of all these firstborns. I don't know. In the future, your children will ask what this ceremony means. Explain it to them by saying the Lord used his mighty power to rescue us from slavery in Egypt. And, and the king stubbornly refused to set them free. All right, this is, this is the reason for the sacrifice. The Lord used his mighty power to rescue the Israelites from slavery in Egypt. When the king stubbornly refused to set us free, the Lord killed the firstborn male of every animal and the firstborn son of every Egyptian family, including the pharaohs. And he did, he killed them all. This is why we sacrifice to the Lord every firstborn male of every animal and save every firstborn son. So you save the humans, apparently, and you sacrifice all the animals. That's the way I'm taking this. I could be wrong. But it says, save every son, firstborn son. But sacrifice every firstborn male of every animal and save every firstborn son. That's what it says. Well, this goes on forever, but it's very, very interesting. I never knew any of this stuff. Well, I, you know, you, you, you hear these little bitty bits of stories, and, but I never knew these details. Now, he says, after the king finally let the people go, the Lord did not lead them through the Philistine territory because he was afraid they were going to get attacked by the Philistines. That was the, that, that was the shortest way. God had said, if they are attacked by the Philistines, they may decide to return to Egypt because they're afraid to go through. So he led them around through the desert and toward the Red Sea. The Israelites left Egypt prepared for battle. So the Israelites were thinking they were going to have to have some kind of battles. Now, from the Egyptians or from the territories they were going through? I don't know. All right, he's, it says the Lord led them through the desert, and here's what happens. During the day, the Lord went ahead of his people in a thick cloud. During the night, he went ahead of them in a flaming fire. That way, the Lord could lead them at all times, whether day or night. That's, that's very hard to explain in a material sense, other than some godly creature that could control these elements doing that. This, this is just stunning to me. As they, they're, There's like, I think they said 600,000 males and they're all leaving the country with also women and livestock and all that. Now, they were getting ready, it sounds like, to enter where they were going. But God says, turn around and head back and make them think that you're just wandering because you don't know where to go. So you cross the desert and that they are wandering around trying to find another way to leave the country. All right. So that's what he wanted the king to think. So the king would say, they're weak. They don't know what they're doing. I'm going to attack you. See, I will make the king stubborn again and he will try to catch up to you. Then I will destroy him and his army. People everywhere will praise me for my victory, and the Egyptians will know that I really am the Lord. The Israelites obeyed the Lord and camped where he told them. So they were going in, and they were ready to go, and he said, no, 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 come back, and they'll think that you just don't know what you're doing, and then they'll attack you. Then we take them out. All right, so the king and his crew decide, no, we're not going to let them go. So they changed their minds and said, look what we have done. We let them get away, and they will no longer be our slaves. The king got his war chariot and army ready. He commanded his officers in charge of his 600 best chariots and all of his other chariots to start after the Israel Israelites. All right, so... The, the Israelites are camping by the side of the Red Sea and all of the 
Pharaoh's guys and chariots and everything were coming down on him. When the Isra Israelites saw the king coming with his army, they were frightened and begged the Lord for help. All right, so now they're all upset at Moses again because they think they're going to just be killed. He said, uh, we, you know, why, why, why did you bring us out of Egypt anyway? While we were there, didn't, didn't we tell you to leave us alone? We had rather be slaves in Egypt than die in this desert. Moses answered, don't be afraid. Be brave and you will see the Lord save you. Okay, this, you know, like I say, I never read any of this stuff. This is just blowing me away. The, the um, Israelites are scared to death because they see the Pharaoh coming at them. So he says, the Lord will fight for you and you won't have to do a thing. The Lord said to Moses, why do you keep calling out to me for help? What's the matter with you? Take care of your own self. Tell the Israelites to move forward. Then hold your walking stick over the sea. The water will open up and make a road where they can walk through on dry ground. That's the key. Because I, I always say, if they move the water, it's just going to sink in the mud. Now listen to this. He's going to make it so he's going to open the sea and they can walk through on dry ground. That's the key. I was, they, they, they couldn't go through if it's all gooey. He says, I will make the Egyptians so stubborn, because he, God apparently made the Pharaoh stubborn to make it to a point where he was just going to make this, going to wipe them out. He says, I'll make the Egyptians so stubborn that they will go after you, then I will be praised because of what happens to the king and his chariots and cavalry. So they're all coming after him in this dry ground in the midst of the sea, it sounds like. The Egyptians will know for sure that I am the Lord. All this time, God's angel had gone ahead of Israel's army. All right? God's angel had gone ahead of Israel's army. All right, so apparently God had sent an angel to lead Israel's army. So all this time, God's angel had gone ahead of Israel's army, but now he moved behind, so he's covering the rear flank. A large cloud had also gone ahead of them, but now it moved between the Egyptians and the Isra Israelites. So now they got some kind of cloudish thing between them. The cloud gave light to the Israelites, but made it dark for the Egyptians. It's a dipole. It's a dipole. It's a, it's, that's just what like a magnet is. One side has got energy, and one side has got the darkness. So it said the cloud gave light to the Israelites, but made it dark for the Egyptians. During the night, they could not come any closer. All right, so the Egyptians couldn't get any closer. Now, the only thing, the only reason I could think of during the, the night they couldn't come any closer is just too hard to navigate. So Moses stretched his arm over the sea, and the Lord sent a strong east wind. It blew all night until there was dry land where the water had been. The sea opened up, and the Israelites walked through on dry land with a wall of water on each side of them. That's just, yikes. The Egyptian chariots and cavalry went after them. All right, now this was written a long time ago. This is in the book of Exodus. All right, so the Egyptians are chasing the Israelites, and before daylight, the Lord looked down at the Egyptian army from the fiery cloud. So the Lord was either on or is the fiery cloud or is around it somewhere and made them panic. So he looked down at the Egyptian army from the fiery cloud. I look at all these little words because they mean something. So he looked from the fiery cloud and made the Egyptian army panic. Now, their chariot wheels got stuck, and it was hard for them to move. 
I, I would have thought that was because of the mud, but it said it was dry ground. So anyway, so the Egyptians said to one another, let's leave these people alone. Let's get the hell out of town. The Lord is on their side and is fighting against us. So what did the Lord say to Moses? All right, so the Lord told Moses, stretch your arm toward the sea. The water will cover the Egyptians and their cavalry and chariots and drown them all. So Moses stretched out his arm, and at daybreak the water rushed toward the Egyptians. They tried to run away, but the Lord drowned them in the sea. It says this was a hell of a flood that flooded them all. The chariots, the cavalry, the whole Egyptian army, all of them that followed the Israelites into the sea, not one of them was left alive. That's a pretty serious statement. The sea had made a wall of water on each side of the Israelites. So they walked through on dry land, just straight through. That's, that's crazy, but you know, like I say, the whole thing is crazy, but there's some of this, it's just true as far as I can tell, unless you can tell me th these things didn't happen. You know, somebody recorded this. Did it happen? I'm starting to think yes. I would have laughed like hell that it was just impossible, you know, and most people do. They just think, oh, this is some made up story. But now, you know, if you read Ovid, let me just show you something before we go forward. Don't forget now, we're going to be on that day when the Israelites saw the bodies of the Egyptians washed up on the shore. They knew the Lord had saved them. Well, the Lord is doing all these kind of things with material like a, a, a stick turned into a snake. They're doing all kinds of crazy things. Let me just show you something that Ovid had wrote or written years in the B.C. era. Well, it came from years in the B.C. era. Listen to this. All right, this is ancient Greek, Latin, all that stuff. And he wrote what his, his... All right, Ovid wrote one of the greatest works in history. It was called Metamorphosis. And he wrote all of the things that the ancient Greeks and the Romans and all that, and, you know, Herodotus, and all of these people had recorded in history, Plato and so forth, and Hesiod, Apollodorus, all of them. Now, so he compiles it all together into 250, we call them myths, fakes, just silly little stories. Now, this is right from the creation of Earth, ages of mankind, the flood, Deucalion, who was Noah in the in the Greek, all the way down, all the Hercules and Atlas and, you know, all of them, Prometheus and right down the line, all of these different books he wrote about the different the gods, and I mean all of the gods. Ajax, Ulysses, Troy, the fall of Troy. All this is serious stuff. Now he gets down in here. This is the key to the whole story here. Is that it, this is all about metamorphosis? The gods controlled matter. Metamorphosis or transformation, trans changing something is a unifying theme amongst the episodes of his works called the Metamorphosis. Ovid raises its significance explicitly, instantly, in the opening lines of the poem. Then he goes into a little Greek here, in nova fert animus mutatos discere formos corpora, which means, I intend, now listen carefully, I intend to speak of forms changed into new entities. He's talking about things, he's speaking of things which forms changed into new entities. So they're changing, they're morphing. That's what metamorphosis is all about. A butter, a, a, a crystallous caterpillar changing into a butterfly or a, you know, that type of thing. So he raises this metamorphosis about things changing into new entities. Well, what does it mean? 
Accompanying this theme is often violence inflicted upon a victim whose transformation, whose change, becomes part of the natural landscape. Right? Did you hear what I just said? These creatures, these forms, turn into the natural landscape. All right? There is a great variety of these changes. They could do anything they wanted. So there's a great variety among the types of transformations, changes that take place from humans into inanimate objects like the Nile River or constellations or animals or plants or from f animals into funguses or mushrooms, from humans into one sex or another, into hyenas, and from one color to another, like and they can become pebbles, anything they want. They can do that, they can become rain, and this is reports of virtually everything that we're talking about in these early stories that Ovid has documented. And that is also in Apollodorus and so forth. But this is the key, this is it, metamorphosis. And this was as well written as the Bible and as well respected because it was the ancient histories of all of these different great heroic people in, in, in history. Herodotus, I mean, um, Hesiod was the guy. Okay, this is Hesiod. They call him Hesiod for some reason. I call him Hesiod. Anyway, he was an ancient Greek poet, lived approximately 750 BC. Now, at this time, it appears that Zeus, who is Jupiter, was still here on Earth, and his daughters were the, um, uh, boy, I can't remember what their names were. Hold on a second. All right. Here's the key. Hesiod, they call him Hesiod. He, so go with Hesiod, Hesiod. I, call, I keep saying Hesiod. Now, he wrote the Theogony, and the reason he wrote all of these books was he was instructed to by the daughters of of Zeus, who was Jupiter or Zeus, he was the god in control of this solar system. He was literally the god and he was living up on Mount Olympus and Zeus, Jupiter, was he was a sexual god and he was in control of this solar system. He was the big god of this particular solar system at this time and the, his daughters came down and told Hesiod to write what they told him to write, which was all of the history of humanity, which their father, Zeus, wanted to have written as a history. So it's called the Theogony, all right? The origins of the world, the cosmogony, and of the gods, the Theogony, or where the God, he wanted to be known what happened. The beginning, what, chaos, what about chaos? What about Gaia? What about Tartarus? What about Euros? And shows a special interest in genealogy. All of the history of the gods is laid out there. And it was, it was taken up by Apollodorus a couple of hundred BC to, to list this out very, very, it's, it's scary as hell. I'm going to tell you that right now. Embedded in Greek myth, there remains fragments of quite variant tales hinting, hinting at the rich variety of myth once existed. Well, I'm going to show you some of the myth, but it comes that right down to its retelling of the old stories became, according to Herodotus, accepted version that linked all Hellenes. It's the earliest known source for the myth of Pandora, Prometheus, which Prometheus was supposedly in the Greek myth Prometheus, Prometheus was the father of Deucalion. Deucalion was Noah. And Prometheus told Noah, who was Deucalion, build yourself a chest because you're going to have to ride out this flood. He knew it was coming. And Pandora, you see they're talking about Pandora here or somewhere? Pandora? Pandora was supposedly the first woman created by the gods as a punishment to man. <laughs> yeah, it worked. 
Now, I, I, I know I talked to you about the yeast, which kind of freaks me out. I just can't understand it. But there are 500 plus species of yeast. Each one of them is, is a fungus, basically. They're used in fermentation for bread, alcohol, and other things. Origins hundreds of millions of years ago. Well, that's what they say. Now, well, what is yeast? It's a single cell fungus. It's like a bacteria, but it's a fungus. It's only visible with a microscope. It takes 20 billion yeast cells to weigh one gram. There's 454 grams in one pound. All right. To grow, yeast cells digest food, and this allows them to obtain energy. Now, baking yeast leavened bread the yeast ferments the sugars and does all this stuff well, why was it so don't have it anywhere near you don't eat anything with it don't have it anywhere in your house don't even let it in your town I mean it, it was so anti-yeast it was just amazing does anybody have any idea why you know it says down here once it's exposed to the air it should be stored you know, in a well-sealed freezer, whatever, I don't know. These are the kind of things that lead me down those rabbit holes. You, you know, you got to try to understand everything. Why, why, what is this all about the yeast? What's that about? You know, I don't see anywhere where they're talking about Hesiod being told to sit down and write by the daughters of Zeus. They talk about him writing all this stuff. The, the, the theogony concerns the origins of the world, which is the cosmology, the gods, the beginning, chaos, Gaia, Tartarus, Eurus, genealogy of all the history of these people. Where would he get that from? He got it from the Greek myth, they say, which was the daughters of Zeus. To sit down and write. He said, I can't write. They said, sit down, you will write. And he sat down and he wrote like, I don't know, I think it's 15 books. You see this? This is unbelievable. This is the only thing that tells you about the muses, which are the daughters of Zeus. These are the, they came down and told Hesiod, you will write all of these books about our history. That's what our father wants you to do. And your, our father is God, Zeus. And there's, this, there's nothing in here about it, basically. Virtually nothing. There's this thing, the dance of the muses at Mount Helicon. That's where Hesiod was out tending his sheep, and or goats or whatever he had. And this was carved in 1807. Now Hesiod cites inspiration from the muses while on Mount Helicon. No, not just inspiration. They said, you're going to do this. Sit down, and they gave him a magic rod to write with. Okay, as I've been talking about Hesiod, Hesiod, however you want to say it, and Ovid wrote much later, and I think he cleaned this up a little bit, because Hesiod, Hesiod, wrote a lot more grumpy than, than um, he's portrayed in Ovid, uh, it appears. Now, um, you know, in spite of Hesiod's complaints about poverty, life on his father's farm could not have been too uncomfortable. Works and days is anything to um, to judge by, since he describes the routines of prosperous yeomans, right? Which apparently he was, rather than pe peasants. Anyway, let's. Let, let, <laughs> This is really scandalous. They're talking about, in spite of Hesiod's complaints about poverty and the life on his father's farm, it could not have been too uncomfortable. He was like, he had a bunch of people working for him. Works and days is anything to, if, if works and days is anything to be judged by. Works and days was dictated to him by the muses. He was supposed to say how life worked there, and they had a tier of of bosses and then they had a bunch of like slavish people. So it was works and days since he describes the routines of prosperous people like himself rather than peasants. So, But he's just telling you how the whole system works, that's all. 
Because this was told that he, he, you're going to write about works and days, how the general population works, and you're going to write about the gods. That's what he was told to do by the, the muses. You see this? He, he knew all kinds of stuff. And here, here's what they do. One modern scholar surmises Hesiod may have learned about world geography, especially the catalog of rivers in Theogony, which he had all kinds of knowledge, which he shouldn't have had. He must have listened to his father's accounts of his own sea voyages as a merchant. No, he was divinely inspired. The father probably spoke in some kind of dialect, but Hesiod probably grew up speaking the local whatever that is, belonging to the same dialect group. However, while his poetry features some Oslisms, there are no words that are certainly Boedician. His basic language is the main library dialect of his time. Let's just talk about this. what was written about him, that he was directed by Zeus. Zeus's daughters at the direction of Zeus. So at this time, which was approximately 700, 800 BC, somewhere around there. Let's say it was 800 BC. They're saying 750, 650, whatever. At that time, the muses were here. And these are the muses. And this is the only thing they show. All right? And they inspired him to write. These were, these were all of the emotions, basically. These, these, the muses were the personifications of emotions. Basically, that's what they were. The gods had personifications of feelings, of, of so forth, and that's, that's what these were. And they wanted Hesiod to write down what they told him to write down while he was on Mount Helicon. All right, I mean, this is just off the... It's just crazy, but it's true as far as I'm concerned now. Aegis, I mean, Zeus, who was the Aegis holder, that's the handle of power, and his lady Hera of Argos in gold sandals striding and the Aegis holder's girl, owl-eyed Athena, and Phobos Apollo and arrowy Artemis, Poseidon earth holder, earthquaking god, Modest Themis and Aphrodite, eyelashes curling, and he be gold crowned and lovely Dione, Dione, whatever, Leto and Iapetus and Kronos, these are gods, his mind bent, Eos and Helios, Helios apparently, I believe, was the sun, and glowing Selene. Gaia, who is apparently the earth, Oceanus, which is the oceans, and the black one, which is the night and the whole eerie brood of the eternal immortals. They once taught Hesiod, these are the immortals, they once taught Hesiod the art of singing verses while, the pastured, while he pastured his lambs on holy helicon slopes. So they came down and they told him how to sing. Ah, and they make everything just wonderful. It's so beautiful. And he made it so good. And so he, he learned how to make singing verses while he pastures his lambs on holy helicon slopes. And this was the very first thing they told me. The Olympian muses, daughters of Zeus, the Aegis holders, or Aegis holder. They told him, hillbillies and bellies, poor excuses for shepherds, whatever that means. We know how to tell many believable lies but also, when we want to, we know how to speak the plain truth. So spoke the daughters of great Zeus. These were the daughters of Zeus, mimicking their own, whoops, mincing their words, and they gave me a staff. So they gave him a staff, Hesiod on Mount Helicon, the daughters of Zeus, a branch of good, sappy laurel, plucking it off, spectacular. And they breathe into me a voice divine, so I might celebrate past and future. And they told me to him, the generation of the eternal gods. They wanted this all laid out of the eternal gods. All right? 
but always to sing of themselves the muses first and last. <laughs> I'm here to honor the great, wonderful muses. Of course, there's gods too. And but at the end, you're supposed to say, yeah, you know all about those gods, but really, well, the things you want to really learn are the muses. Anyway, but why all this about oak tree or stone? I don't know about that. Start from the muses. When they sing for Zeus' father, they thrill the great mind deep in Olympus, which is the, where his headquarters is, telling what is, what will be, and what has been, blending their voices and weariless. The sound flows sweet from their lips and spreads like lilies, and Zeus's thundering hail halls shine with laughter. Everybody's happy. They're just, they're just wonderful personifications of happiness and love and all that stuff. All right, so this is something about the laurels associated with Apollo and so with poets. This apparently proverbial line seems to be a way of saying enough about that. Now, so in Olympus, snowy peaks, which was he set up shop on this mountain, and the halls of the gods echo the strains of their immortal chanting. Honors first the primordial generation of the gods who in, in the beginning earth and sky bore the gods. Earth and sky bore the gods. This is the primordial generation of gods whom in the beginning earth and sky bore. Comma. When the divine benefactors born from them, so they bore more. And the second, Zeus and father of gods. So Zeus was supposedly the top god in the solar system. But obviously he wasn't the top god of the top god because you already got the sky and the earth and all that stuff being born from somewhere. The primordial generation of gods whom in the beginning earth and sky bore. So earth and sky bore these gods, but somebody had earth and sky, I would say. Anyway. Divine benefactors born from them, and the second ones were Zeus, the father of the gods and men, mightiest of the gods and strongest by far. Zeus is Jupiter, and he's a big guy. Strongest, mightiest by far. And that's true, hundreds of times bigger than Earth. And then the race of humans and of powerful giants. Yes. Zeus Zeus's mind in Olympus is thrilled by the song of the Olympian muses. He just loves his daughters singing. The Storm King's daughters. He's, you can call him the Storm King. He, he, you know, they, they're referring to him as that, but it is Zeus they're referring to. No. They were born on Pieria after our father Cronion mingled with memory, who rules Eleutheria's hills. She bore them to be a forgetting of troubles, a pause in sorrow. There's been a lot of sorrow through the history. It's just incredible when you start really digging in. All right, so for nine nights, wise Zeus mingled with her in love, ascending her sacred bed in isolation from the other immortals. Right. When the time drew near and she see and the seasons turned and the moons had waned and the many days were done, she bore nine daughters. These are the muses. They were all of one mind, with song in their breasts, with hearts that never failed. They were just delightful. Near the topmost peak of snow-capped Olympus, they lived up there in the snow-capped area. There. They must have had some, you know, they could control anything. So they were controlling the atmosphere. They do anything they want. Metamorphosis makes it very, 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 very clear. They had complete control of matter. All right, again, this could be insulting to a lot of people, thinking that this, you know, a lot of people are so entrenched in their beliefs that everything is considered an intrusion, a, a violent intrusion. What it isn't, it is, it's... Just as Jesus Christ said, think, search. As a matter of fact, here it is right here. 
This is the Nag Hammadi text. And again, this is not the Bible. This is the Nag Hammadi text. These were hidden in because if anybody knew about these, they would kill these people. So they hid them in caves and they were just discovered in 1945. And Jesus said, if you find the interpretations, you won't experience death. Jesus said, let him who seeks. First of all, you've got to seek. If you don't seek, well, who needs you? But if you want to seek, continue seeking until you find. When you find, you will become troubled. When you become troubled, you will be astonished and will rule over the all. You're going to be a troubled. I'm telling you right now, if you seek, you will become troubled because you realize nobody else really cares. Very, very few people care. Jesus said, recognize what is in your sight and what is hidden from you will become plain to you. Now, these are the words that are most important to me. There is nothing hidden which will not become manifest. That means you can only hide it for so long and all of a sudden everything is going to be laid on the table and it is on the table right now. So I'm sorry, this is just, this is deep stuff and it, it might rub you the wrong way. It's not intended for that purpose. It's just intended for an open discussion of what was written. And they all have similarities and they all have differences. And that's just the way life is in, for everywhere. I'm not going to see things identical to you and you're not going to see things identical to me. It's just the way life is. So you, you have to look at everybody's, you know, it's almost like doing an investigation. Well, it is doing an investigation. And um, that's what we've done. And we're going to keep going. I'm, not, I, I'm trying to figure this out. Because as far as I'm concerned, you know, they say it isn't over until it's over. I say it isn't over because it's never over. I think you keep coming back round and round and round until you get to a place where they say, okay, you learned enough, now you can stay up here and you don't have to go through that stuff again. Because life is, is tough. And in, 200 years ago, 500 years ago, when you had to scrape a living off the, the ground and there was no electricity, no anything, that, that would be a pretty tough road to hoe. And right now, it's pretty comfortable, but I don't think it's going to be this way for much longer. Things are, are changing quickly. So anyway, I want to know as much as I can know. And if you want to know as much as you can know, stick around. We'll try to figure it out together.